Uh, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to another edition of The Words. Now, we're supposed to have uh, Latonya Millhouse uh, on today, and she is running for Alabama State House District 52. But um, so we're going to change course on today, and I am actually on my way to Huntsville, Alabama, and I'm here with uh, uh, Patricia Jamison, and we're going to uh, come back and be with her in just a moment. So uh, y'all stay tuned. So it's going to be like, uh, I'll say a 30 minute delay, but we'll be back. Uh, -oh. uh good afternoon everybody welcome to uh another edition of the works i'm your host keith williams and i am actually on the road on the way to huntsville alabama for uh, uh a little meeting order a meet and greet whatever you want to call it. Now, uh, today we're supposed to have Latonya Mailhouse, who is running for State House 52 here in uh, Alabama, but we're going to switch gears right now. And uh, I'm actually riding with the gubernatorial candidate, Patricia Salter Jamison. Uh, tell everybody hi. Hello, everybody. So first of all, tell everybody what you are up to today. We to a candidate for me and Green in Huntsville, Alabama. No dirty, no more dirty ink radio broadcast in Huntsville, Alabama, with uh, Minister Fred Whitmell. Okay, and um. Uh... Um, so tell us a little bit about tell us a little bit about your campaign and what have you been up to on the campaign trail? Well, we have well our campaign, as you know, I'm running for governor, Democratic candidate for governor. Um, our campaign is Alabama. Our campaign theme is Alabama United because we can do better and. I would like to see our state united because we have such a great divide. There is so much division in our state. And I just believe that if we bring unity into the state, that there's nothing we cannot accomplish for the good of the state if we are in unity. So we've just been going from one from the southern end of the state to the northern end of the state we have just been traveling all over the state sharing with them our platform and what we want to do for the state of alabama so what what are some of the uh so what are some of the issues that people have brought to your attention while you are was on the campaign trail thank you that's a good question as a matter of fact, we have one, um, one of our platforms is prison reform. And just speaking with relatives who have inmates and have family members in prison, incarcerated, and the injustice that they are receiving and the inhumane treatment of the inmates, it just sheds more light on the fact that we're not doing as a state what we said we would do, that they are in the Department of Corrections, but the, we as a state, we're not doing enough to correct or help them correct the errors or the mistakes they made or the underlying cause. Number one, 
well-being of the mental issues and not being the state not dealing with them and those uh, men and women losing hope and uh, and more more importantly is that i've also learned that there are so many almost innumerable to count inmates whose underlying reason or cause for being there is mental illness. So I would like for us to just really focus on the mental disparities in the prison system and to have uh, the counselors that they need in all of the prison systems. And then we have inmates who have cases that needs to be reviewed by the Department of Correction. Some decision, some judicial rulings were uh, placed or sent down from judges who, who's really, we wanna look at their reasoning. So that's something right now that's, dear, that's pulling at me right now, is dealing with the prison reform and how the prisoners are being treated in Alabama, in addition to the other my other platform. But that's a flashing light for me today. It's so we're really going to we're going to stick to prison reform, you know, just a little bit uh, yes. because uh, I understand that you had a conversation with uh, with a potential voter um, not too long ago. And uh, for those of you who are watching and listening, just kind of want to give you a background. Uh, what's been happening uh, in terms of the prison system here in Alabama. Back in 2019, the Federal Department of Justice had issued uh, an injunction against the state of Alabama due to the conditions of the prisoners in the prison system. It has nothing to do necessarily with the buildings, although some of the buildings uh, do, do need to be prepared, but it's not as extensive as the governor, you know, has said it was going to be. It was exaggerated. And what happened was is that the legislator had approved four hundred million dollars for the Best American Rescue Care Plan Act money, and one hundred thirty-five million dollars from the general fund to build three new prisons, which, in my opinion, would not solve the crisis on how to rehabilitate the prisoners, uh, the inmates, and how to deal with the inhumane treatment of the inmates. So you can build new buildings all you want, but as long as you're not dealing with the problems that are inside of the prisons, it's not going to do much uh, good. So I just want to give you kind of like a, a synopsis of that. Now, the Governor Ivan's administration when they requested this money, they blame it on COVID, saying that they was recuperating losses, you know, due to government, due to COVID in the prisons. But what really happened is that He was forced to resign. In case y'all didn't know what happened, now you know. And so now we're in 2022, and the prison crisis have not been solved. Uh, they have not complied with the Federal Department of Justice request. Okay, so uh, we're back. We're here with uh, Salter Jameson, and we were just talking about uh, uh, prison reform and what's her what does what her vision for uh, prison reform, and we just kind of give a summary of how we, you know, come to the mess that we got ourselves into as a state on why the uh, Federal Department of Justice has slapped the injunction on Alabama. And so uh, going back uh, uh, to that, 
have you had a conversation with a constituent uh, about that? Um, so what, what are some of your plans on, on to address that? Do, do we really have to have we definitely do and we need to address that just from talking with her and hearing her heart and hearing the hearts of others we the inmates and advocates in the government the judicial system needs to be looked at the sentences needs is for review of the sentences that have been given ridiculous sentences and when i say ridiculous i mean when they've been given more years in prison than we have people that have gone out and committed violent crimes, like say, for example, the young young man, Rittenhopper, remember when he was at the uh, the Black Lives Matter? Was that the rally that he was at? Remember when he took it upon himself to uh, kill the protesters and, and he was acquitted. And, and then you'll have someone else who has uh, a less violent, a nonviolent crime, and they get almost life or life due to the habitual offender law. And what I would like to do is also go back and look at esponging the, the sentences of those that are incarcerated due to personal uh, possession of of marijuana because I would like to decriminalize marijuana. And when we expunge their records, they will be given all of their rights back as US citizens, as citizens of the state of Alabama. They will be given the And if you serve the time when you are released, you should automatically, upon release, receive your right to vote. Because if you still are being denied the right to vote, you are still locked up because you don't have all rights as a full citizen. So I want to see the system re revamped. I would like to do a complete analysis of it do some surveys and, and, and data research. I want to hear from the family members. I want to hear from their side. We, I've heard from, we've heard from the, the legislature. We've heard our side. I want to hear what the families have to say. And I think it's time out for us allowing the big businesses to go in and fleece the families or extort the families with these high charges because the members are the ones who have to put money on the inmate books or whether they can afford it or not. So it's taking money from their living expenses to provide for the inmate. I really say it's time out. Alabama, we have got to do better. We've got to look at what's going on in our prison system and stop closing your eyes. Alabama, what we ignore happening to someone else may one day come knocking at your door. We have got to do something about it. Now, do you believe that if Alabama does not comply with uh, the federal DOJ's uh, complaint, will it's possible that the federal government would take over this, uh, the state prison system? Yes, I believe that. Now, we don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm quite sure that they're going to address some of the concerns that in their complaint. Now, another thing that was discussed in that conversation was HB House Bill 143, supposed to do an update on the good time law. 
And somebody said that's not a good law. I believe that it, it is. And let me tell you why I believe that uh, it's a good law to offer good time. Because I believe now um, we had an incident that happened where you can't change laws based on one incident. And I believe that was why it was rescinded was based on one incident. Now, I believe that if you take away the, the hope of a person, and that's what we've done when we've taken away the good time, is that hope and that incentive where they are motivated to be on their best behavior. Because if I'm on my good behavior, and if I avoid this conflict, then I will be able to be discharged at an earlier a date, then I am not going to participate in it. But if I have nothing to lose, I'm, I'm, then there, there goes the population. There we have the violence. We have it, it, the drug usage is out of control because we have no incentive for them. It needs to be reinstated. What, what is the relationship between the prison system and mental health? Thank you for asking me that. I believe that there are, because of a lack of mental health, first of all, let me back up if I may. The stigma that we place on mental health have placed or caused a lot of people to be in denial or afraid to seek help. And so a lot of the crimes that are being committed, the underlying cause or the root cause, if we were to do a root cause analysis of it, it would be the mental health. And because we're not addressing the mental health issues, then we're placing inmates in prison who really need to be maybe in an uh, institution or uh, maybe uh, just uh, going in for outpatient care on a daily basis or inpatient, but they need to be treated for their mental disparities as opposed to being locked up. Now we got them locked up with mental issues and those issues are not being addressed. So most of them are worsening and are being ignored. And once they are dis discharged or from prison, then the problem is still there. So the underlying cause has never been addressed nor treated. So then there's a vicious cycle because they're going to do exactly what got them there the first place. And then we, we're, the revolving door, it keeps going. It's an ever revolving door. So an another thing that the uh, caller was talking about earlier was the school, the prison pipeline. Oh my. Yeah. So that, so that suggests that if, in, in the state of Alabama, if your child cannot read past the third grade level, it's suggested that when that child becomes a teenager or adult, that that child will end up in prison. And in our public school systems, they're making it to see, they're making it by design that your child would not necessarily succeed in school so that they're saying in that sense that your child would eventually go into a life of crime. But we know that's a lie. Exactly. But that is a lie. Why? They are. I was talking to she fosters their parents are incarcerated. You know what her 10 year old foster son said? He said, I'm 
I'm going to be in prison. Okay, so let me get this straight. Uh, uh, this two-year-old foster child said that uh, I've already acknowledged that I'm going to prison. At 10 years old. So what, what, what does that tell you? That tells me that we need to reach these children at an earlier age, and we need to teach our children and help them to that they can do better. We need to instill and see your maybe your father made a mistake and he is in prison, but that does not have to be your future. And we're here to help you to make sure that it's not. And I believe that that is exactly what the school system should do. And I think as a community, as a state, as a governor, I would like to make sure we have programs implemented in neighborhoods, on the privileged neighborhoods, so those children do not feel hopeless. They don't have role models. Let's put some role models in there. So they will have someone to model after to see that, hey, this is what I want to do. This is who I can be like. I don't have to be an inmate because there is no future in that. And that was heartbreaking to hear a 10 year old think that that was his future. Oh my goodness. Somebody really needs to talk to him. We are in. hard to hear that a 10 year old, not even a teenager yet, is thinking that all that my future is going to be behind bars. Yeah. That is a sad commentary. And one of the things that you mentioned uh, about education, um, first of all, I just want to thank you, uh, Ms. Jamison, for taking part in the press conference on Friday uh, concerning uh, placing a charter school in, uh, in a predominantly African-American community. Uh, I just want to say that perfect uh, on air personally uh, to say thank you, because it's not often that that will know community, a community that has been and that Alabama is larger than people ever you know, realize is that you have to be governor for everybody, exactly. not just a selective peer. So, and Patricia Jameson is a strong advocate for public education. Yes, I am. So can you tell us a, a little bit about that? I know that's not your background, but... Well, what I can say again, and thank you all for allowing me to appear there, but to see that school. Here. Still a student at that school, and then have a charter school coming in to want to take out not only that public dollars, the taxpayer money is going with those students. And then that school suffers because they do not have the resources be to maintain the quality of education that they have because now you want to pull our best teachers out. I am all in for our neighborhoods, our schools especially. And what really got my heart was to see the fathers out, the fathers out advocating for their children's education, the fathers out advocating for the reading scores, the math scores, the science, wanting to see their children achieve and 
going to be, if I'm elected, I will be the governor for everybody. So I want every community to know that as your governor, I'm your advocate. I will be there for you. I will fight with you and for you. We want to see our schools do better. All schools across the board, quality education for all Alabama schools. And it does, and we don't need the charter schools to provide quality education for our students. And thank you so very much for again for allowing me to have been there to help us shine the light on what's going on in Tittiesville, because Tittiesville, Washington Elementary School is an upcoming school in our state. And we are so thankful for all of the teachers, the principals, the teacher of the year, and all of their hard work is paying off. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Al Alabama uh, has recently passed the largest education budget in state history. Do you believe that that money should be uh, equitably distributed to all of the school systems in the state of Alabama? And I say equity, uh, equitably, not equally, because you have some school systems that are well to do. Yes. And then you have some that are, you know, are not. So do you believe that funding should be equitably? distribute to the school systems in the state of Alabama and not equal. Yes. And the reason why I say that is because, as you stated, there are some areas, some communities, excuse me, where the tax payers, where the, the economic status of the citizens are not the same as they are in certain areas. Like say, for example, if you had look at Mountain Brook and then look at Tittiesville, of course, you know that Tittiesville will need more than Mountain Brook because of the status of those parents and the taxes that are there and the taxes that are in Tittiesville. Well, uh, very one, one, wonderful answer. Uh, I, I know uh, education and criminal reform probably been one of the top issues uh, from my understanding uh, from candidates that are running for governor uh, on the Democratic side. Not, not hearing too much on the Republican side of that criminal justice reform education on top, you know, on their top uh, priority list. So now we're going to have a few more questions and we're going to close out here. Um, out of all the candidates that are running for governor, why do you believe that you would stand out? I believe number one is that I have a heart for the people. I believe that um, I am the candidate for the people because when they vote for me, they're going to vote for them, be voting for themselves. I will be your advocate. I will be your voice. And I have been prepared through my experiences as a nurse, as a minister of the gospel. I have been serving the public all of my life. And I believe what I've learned, the skill sets that I've learned, the uh, personal, the ability to work across the board with all socioeconomic classes of people, I believe that that will enable me to serve the citizens of Alabama, all of the citizens of Alabama, and not just one. I will be the governor that helps Alabama to become united, one state and for all, and that one and for all. And that's what I would love to see happen in our state and close this great divide. So we have about three more days until the election. What would you like to say to the voters of Alabama? Voters, 
first of all, I would like to say, get out and vote. Do not forget, Tuesday, May 24th, 2022, go out and vote for Pat. A vote for Pat, Patricia Salter Jamison, is a vote for you. I am asking for your vote. If you would go to my website, Pat, the number four governor.org, Pat, the number four governor.org, and you will be able to see my platform. You will be able to see where I stand. And also from that website, you can send me questions and ask me and share your concerns. Ask me about how I plan to address the concerns of your community. And I will be happy to discuss them with you. I look forward to hearing from you. And most importantly, your vote on Tuesday, May 24th. Thank you, Alabama in advance. Thank you. Uh, you, you gave your website already, but is there any other contact information that you want to give out? Yes. Um, what you can do is they can give me a call. If they would, they can give me a call on my uh, website. They can give me a call at this number. They can call me at 807. That's 807. I'm sorry, 205. 807-0569. That's 205-807-0569. 205-807-0569. That is our campaign's phone number. Give us a call. And if we're not, if we're not able to answer, leave a message and I'll give you a call back. Thank you so very much. And we're going to uh, conclude here. I know we had, this This is the first time that the podcast has ever been on the road and uh, we ran into some, it's a little difficulty, but uh, those that know me know. And we did it. Uh, our first podcast on the road with uh, Democratic gubernatorial candidate Patricia Salter Jameson. And I know you can't see her because she's driving, but uh, thank you so much for being part of this podcast. One that ever been produced on the road. So there you have it. Uh, so she got a bonus. You know, anytime that a candidate wants to come on and you know they don't show up, that's on them. Somebody else will get the opportunity. And we are doing great well here. It's uplifting our candidates who are running for office. Don't forget, we got three days. Do your research on your candidates. Yeah. Call them, ask questions, hold them accountable. You know, you know, let let them work for you. Because that's the only way that we're able to make an intelligent decision on who we're going to vote for. And then most importantly, on Tuesday, May 24th, regardless of who you vote for or who you're supporting, make sure you go out to the polls and vote. Uh, Senator State, uh, our mayor already predicted that it's going to be a 25 to 35% turnout. Don't listen to them. Prove them wrong. Get out to vote. Don't sit at home. Get out to vote. Let's let's make John Merrill out of a liar. Get out to vote on May 24th. Thank you so much. And don't forget tomorrow we are having a election eve networking gallery or get out to vote. Uh, Outreach Gallery on tomorrow. Uh, please tune in to the Australia Broadcast Section Facebook page for more information. We will be broadcasting live there. It will start at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central. So please, we hope that you'll be able to come in person. The information, of course, is on our event page. 
at www.facebook.com slash Australia Broadcast Section. That's all lowercase letters. Off of that, or you can join us on Zoom on tomorrow. So until then, this evening at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, we will have Chris Christie, who is running for circuit judge for Jefferson County, Alabama, place 12. We hope that you would join us. So until then, have a great evening.